So in the summer of 2016, my doorbell rang. I went to the door, opened it, and there was a salesman. He was there to convince me that I should switch my ISP, my internet service provider. I invited him in because I was curious. The deal he had was that he was going to cut my price in half, and he was going to double my speed. I asked a few questions, and I signed up. Three months later, I'm walking through my kitchen, and my wife is paying bills at the computer. And I noticed an invoice from our new internet service provider. I picked it up, and I was surprised that they were charging me five times the deal that I had signed up for but they were giving me 10 times the bandwidth. If you do a search on the companies with the worst customer service in 2017, <laughs> across all industries, guess which industry has the top three spots? That's right, internet service providers. <clears throat> And you may think this is an operational flaw, but I don't think so. I think it has to do with the structure of the industry itself. So what is an internet service provider? One way to think about it is that it's the on-ramp to the internet. It's the way that we access the internet. And something you need to understand is that if you're going to compete in this business, you got to build your own infrastructure. you got to get a signal or a wire to every one of your customers. As you translate this photo, you might think that UPS is doing something illegal. <laughs> but if we ran our shipping business the way we run our internet service provider business, then FedEx would build their own highway, then UPS would build their own highway, and then the United States Postal Service would build their own highway. <clears throat> and this makes absolutely no sense in the physical world, and it no longer makes any sense in the digital world. But this is an important point. An internet service provider is a service and it runs on infrastructure. We're used to thinking about those as one thing. But infrastructure is one thing, and the service is another thing. So what are the consequences of this model that we have currently? Well, one consequence is that there's not very much competition because the barriers to entry are so high. And when there's no competition, we know the prices are going to be inflated. Another consequence is an, the idea of bandwidth scarcity. Now, when the internet first came out, bandwidth was a scarce commodity or a scarce resource. But today we have fiber optics. And data scientists can push 5 million megabits per second over fiber optics in a laboratory environment and 100,000 megabits in a commercial environment. Then why is the national average in the US around 25 megabits per second? It should be affordable to have a gig to mo most homes in the United States. We don't need a gig. We couldn't use a gig, but it should be affordable. So why is the national average 25? Well, one reason is that there's a lot of old infrastructure in the ground. And companies continue to milk that infrastructure rather than to invest in fiber optics. Another reason is that these companies want us to believe that bandwidth is a scarce resource. Because if you think it's a scarce resource, when they charge you to give you more of it, you'll feel okay about it. 
Another reason the average is at 25 is something known as the digital divide. And if you looked at a map of the United States and could see the digital divide, you would see that urban areas are well connected and rural areas are not. One of the most insidious parts of the digital divide is that school children do all or some of their homework online. And if you're a parent that lives on the wrong side of the digital divide, well, you understand the problem. Structurally, the thing that makes the least sense about the way this industry works is that the internet was based on openness. That means it's open to competition and it's open to innovation. What about our on-ramp to the internet? It works exactly the opposite. Our ISPs are based on a closed model, closed to competition and closed to innovation, at least outside innovation. Rory Sutherland says <clears throat> that he talks about wealth as a function of the number of rewarding choices an individual can make. And that technologies that are really valuable are those that allow us to do things that we care about that were not previously possible. Eight years ago, some colleagues and I started a company which we called Entry Point Networks. And we wanted to rethink the entry point to the internet. <clears throat> we had two images in our mind when we started the company. One, going back to FedEx and UPS, notice that they're on one road. The other image is the image of an airport. In both of these images, pay attention to the difference between infrastructure and services. The infrastructure is robust, and the services run on top of the infrastructure. In both cases, whether it's trucking or airline companies, they follow the rules. They have open access or open use of the infrastructure. As we progressed as a company, we were fortunate to meet a group of researchers here at the University of Utah called the Flux Research Group in the School of Computing. And then we also met a city in southeastern Idaho, a small city, by the name of Ammon. As a group, we shared the same vision, and that vision was that we wanted to move control from the ISP to the consumer. As we worked together, Ammon, the leaders in Ammon, had three goals. They wanted to get robust infrastructure to every resident. They wanted to make it voluntary to participate. And they wanted to make the residents owners of the infrastructure rather than renters. <clears throat> As we worked at the University of Utah, we thought if we had robust infrastructure, then we could create a cloud for services. For four years, we worked together. And then one year ago, in the fall of 2016, our science experiment went live. If you're a resident that subscribes to the network in Ammon, Idaho today, you have a gig pipe to your house. And you can change your internet service provider in 20 seconds. You go into a portal, you find the plan that you want, you click subscribe, a network is provisioned, and you're live. If you get dissatisfied, you click unsubscribe. The network is torn down, and then you can choose a new plan. <clears throat> if you can change your service provider in 20 seconds, it fundamentally changes the value you get from that service provider. What about price? Before Ammon launched its network, the average cost of an ISP was $75 for a 50 meg connection. The day Ammon launched its network, the first ISP came on with a 100 meg connection, priced at $45. Within 10 months, because of competition, that 100 meg ISP had fallen to $9.99. Mm -mm. 
I mentioned that city leaders in Ammon wanted to make the residents owners and not renters of the infrastructure. How does that work? The residents pay $17 a month for their infrastructure until it's paid off. When it's paid off, it's theirs. It stays with the house. They then pay $16.50 for maintenance and operation of the network. And then they go into the cloud and they choose the plan that they want. In this case, a 100 by 100 connection for $9.99. That's less than $44 for a one gig pipe and a 100 by 100 connection. So we're already spending enough money to have robust fiber optics in most parts of the country. We just need to structure these systems different. So what's the significance of Ammon and our science experiment? One significance is that three groups, a private company, a research group from a university, and a small city have worked together to solve important problems. Then there's the significance to Ammon itself, that we effectively have moved control from the ISP to the consumer. We've given them more value for less cost. Because Ammon will have a fiber network throughout the whole city, everything that the city cares about and that the residents care about will be connected to this network. And because it's open infrastructure, we're betting that we're going to be surprised by the amount of innovation that happens on telemedicine, education, public safety, aging in place, and on we go. One other significance is that Ammon provides a model for other cities. Now, at least 100 cities have tried some form of municipal broadband, but I believe Ammon is the first to define the problem differently. Those other cities have focused on fast internet, and many of them have just copied the traditional ISP model. Ammon defined the problem as open infrastructure, creating competition, moving control to the customer. The last significance comes from Kevin Kelly. He's my favorite philosopher of technology. When he talks about the importance of communication networks, he says that they have a special place in economic history because this is a sector of the economy that's transforming all other sectors. Our argument is that this sector that's transforming all other sectors itself needs to be transformed. So the next time you get frustrated with customer service, or you don't like the value that you're getting from your ISP, think of Ammon, and remember that if your city will move control to the customer, you could fix that problem in 20 seconds. Thank you.